Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining Centerstone for uh, National Suicide Prevention Month. Uh, my name is Robert Lambert. I'm the Public Relations Manager at Centerstone, and I'm joined today by a handful of our wonderful experts, and we're going to be discussing a few things around suicide prevention. Um, we're going to wait just a few seconds to let some viewers hop on, um, and then we'll get started. So thank you again for joining us. So we should have some viewers on. We should have some viewers on now. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Again, uh, my name is Robert, um, and this is Centerstone's uh, first Facebook Live video for National Suicide Prevention Month. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, our very own Becky Stull, who will introduce herself, and then we'll let our other speakers introduce themselves as well. Great, thanks Robert. So hello, Facebook world. Uh, I'm Becky Stoll. I'm Centerstone's Vice President for Crisis Services, Suicide Prevention and Disaster Mental Health and am located in what is today kind of sunny, uh, home of the uh, favorite bachelorette destination in the world, Nashville, Tennessee. And I'll turn it over to Greg to introduce himself. Thanks, Becky. Hi, my name is Greg Bennett, and I am a uh, crisis care consultant team lead for our Centerstone crisis team. I'm also a certified peer recovery specialist, and our home office is in Nashville, but we cover a, a lot of area here in Tennessee and other places. Great, and I'll dive in. Hi there, I'm Lauren Conaboy. I am our Vice President for National Policy and based out of Colorado. All right, thank you guys so much. And with that, we'll go ahead and get started. And so um, our first question is gonna be for Becky. Uh, Becky, can you tell us a little bit about um, the statistics on suicide in the United States and what kind of trends we're seeing? Yeah, I mean, that was a that would have been an interesting question, even without COVID um, playing a role recently um, in the US, we, you know, we've seen as a lot of you all who are watching know that the suicide rates have continued to climb in the direction um, that that's not good, you know, a decade or plus ago when I would teach and, and talk about statistics. We would we would talk about you know 28,000, 29,000, and that numbers just continue to go up. To you know now we're up in the high 40s in terms of annual suicide deaths. That's not even counting attempts. Uh, when you overlay COVID, kind of what we had been saying for the past few months was we don't know yet, uh, and there's a period of time that we're you know in the middle of this and we really didn't know the impact of what what the what was going to happen to mental health in general and suicide um, but a couple of um, pieces of information have come out in the last you know week couple of weeks that really are starting to reveal what the tea leaves i think are going to show us um, the cdc put out a report um, the week of august 14th and it was pretty startling to see um, that the the COVID pandemic uh, is definitely being associated with an increase in mental health challenges for folks, specifically around anxiety, depression, and increased substance use. Um, and they looked at April to June of 2019, and then the same time period in this year where you know we were really at the height of COVID, um, and there was considerable increases in the the number of folks experiencing things like anxiety and depression. Um, part of that study, they also looked at, um, they surveyed individuals, um, and 41% of individuals reported at least one mental health issue that was going on for them, uh, which was pretty startling. Um, even more startling was when they asked about suicide, and if you had thoughts of suicide in the last 30 days prior to the um, surveying, 
um, and around 11% did, but those numbers were much higher for certain individuals. There were some little pockets where the rates were even higher than that 11%. For um, folks ages 18 to 24, the number was 26%. So that's a group we need to be worried about. And there's about four of these groups. The next was minority. The, um, about 19% of minorities reported having suicidal thoughts in the last 30 days. Um, unpaid caregivers having to take care of others in their lives during this kind of lockdown, they were at 31% had thought about, 31% of these unpaid caregivers in the last 30 days had thought of suicide. Um, and then essential workers, their um, percentage was 22%. So, you know, we're seeing a lot more and we have this data, you know, to really start kind of clearing the, the picture up that one mental health um, is really being impacted by the pandemic. Um, and two, that people um, are thinking about suicide and there's, a, there's really kind of four buckets of individuals that we should have some specific um, worry about. Excellent, thank you so much for that. Um, and just wanna remind everyone watching um, that we have lots of information available on our website at centerstone.org backslash suicide, including our crisis line information. And we also welcome any uh, questions from the viewers as well. So if you have questions, just leave those in the comments and we'll be sure to get to those at the end of the video. But with that, uh, I'm gonna talk to, or we'll talk with Greg next. Um, Greg, you work in Centerstone's Crisis Call Center. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what, what you've been seeing uh, there, there from callers and what you do to help people when they call in? Yeah, no problem. So one thing I think it's important to remember that crisis looks different for different people. Um, so, you know, we have a, a wide range of calls. There is definitely, I feel, uh, been an increase in the anxiety type calls, uh, people calling us in the middle of a panic attack and, you know, we're we're equipped and trained to help them de-escalate and get calmed down and get through that. Um, the thing I've noticed with uh, the COVID and, and suicide uh, ideation um, is that it, it just seems to be like one more thing on top of people's problems. So I haven't seen a whole lot of calls directly or uh, specifically related to COVID but it's just like one more stressor that people are dealing with that, that might be pushing them over the edge. Um, as far as the, the help that we offer, um, you know, our primary concern with every caller is safety. You know, so that's, that's the first thing we wanna do is guarantee that we can keep that person safe. Um, from there, we, we might uh, provide some follow-up, um, call them the next day, see how they're doing. You know, maybe they just needed to get some rest and it's a new day and they're feeling better. Um, we can uh, help them get engaged in services, um, get schedules set up. Um, maybe it's someone that's not been in services for a while, we can help them get re-engaged. Um, <clears throat> and of course, we also offer uh, mobile crisis services, which has really changed in the, the midst of this COVID because that was a, you know, primarily face-to-face -face service. Um, but, you know, thankfully we have the technology that we have, it's made things a little easier. Um, you know, so we can still do those assessments and get people the care that they need. That's great. So basically it sounds like what you're saying is that if someone calls in and they're having some of these, um, these feelings that there's different options depending on you know whatever they might be facing is that correct yeah and, and like i said it really just depends on the caller um for a lot of people de-escalating will include us maybe talking about self-care or healthy coping skills um you know what are some things you can try to maybe get through the night we'll um even go as far as you know deep breathing exercises um really whatever we can you know to help them out Excellent, thank you. Um, so one of the problems that we often hear about is um, that there's sometimes difficulty accessing mental health care in the United States. And uh, Lauren, you've recently been working on an initiative known uh, as 988, 
And so I was hoping you might be able to tell us a little bit about that today. Yeah, thanks, Robert. And we just heard from Greg who talked about what happens when you call a crisis call center. And, and so what we're trying to accomplish um, through the advocacy of Centerstone and so many other mental health organizations is to make that connection to those crisis services easier. We grow up in this country knowing that if there's a medical emergency, we call 911, but we don't grow up knowing what to do if there's a mental health emergency. We don't know what growing up to do. We don't know what to do when we grow up knowing if um, ourself or a family member has thoughts of suicide. How do we help them? How do we connect them to care? And so today there is a national suicide prevention line, which is 1-800-273-TALK. Um, so that exists. But what we want to do is we want to take that number and move it to a three-digit number, similar to what we have for 911. And so that number um, will be 988. And it, this number is not in, um, in place yet. Uh, this past July, the FCC announced that um, by July 2022, 988 will go into effect. Uh, we're still working with Congress to, to create some other mechanisms to help fund this line, but this can be a game changer. And as we heard from Becky earlier, there has been some really compelling data from the CDC that um, through the course of the pan pandemic, now one in four young Americans is struggling with su suicidal thinking and thoughts. And so knowing that we have so many people around the country struggling with this, and the longer this goes on, we know that the stressors continue. We know that um, kind of pandemic fatigue, crisis fatigue is, is real. And so we're going to need long-term ways to create better access to mental health care. And so our hope is that by, um, by making this a three-digit number so that nationwide, when someone in that moment of crisis um, doesn't know where to go. They just have that three-digit number to go to and they can call. Um, I want to continue to reiterate, um, this number is not live yet. We're working to get it live. And if you as a viewer want to play a role in making this live, you can contact your member of Congress and ask them to pass the National Suicide Hotline Designation Act by the end of September. September, and the reason we're having this is it's Suicide Prevention Month. And so now is more timely than ever for Congress to act. And so just that's a just kind of a shout out to the viewers that if you want to advocate on this, please reach out to a member of Congress and ask them to pass that bill. Excellent. Thank you. And just as a follow up to that, I think um, you mentioned kind of similar to that 988 would be similar to 911. But, you know, sometimes when there is a crisis, people call 911 and, you know, whoever responds to that call may or may not have the most, you know, appropriate information about how to address a mental health crisis. And so uh, 98 would be able to, to better um, connect people to resources. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah. And Becky Excellent. can speak to that even more in terms of what, what that could do from, from the end of mental health. Excellent. Um, so Greg, um, another problem, uh, so we just talked about how access to healthcare and mental health care in particular can sometimes be a little bit difficult. Uh, another difficulty is that there's a really uh, negative stigma around uh, reaching out for help um, when you're in mental health crisis. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, why someone should still reach out for help and not be afraid uh, to ask for it when they need it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, unfortunately, that stigma is still there. Um, you know, we, we get a lot of callers that this is their first time really ever reaching out and opening up about uh, these feelings and thoughts, maybe whatever past trauma they've had and things like that. So in a way, we can kind of act as a doorway to um, help them break some of that stigma so that they can, you know, continue to get services and things. Um, most importantly, though, I just I want everyone to know that they're not alone, that we're here to listen and we're here to help. There's help available. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that have been through similar situations and have been able to get through it and, and move on with their lives. You know, you don't have to be the exception. Um, this this will work for anyone. You just got to give us a chance. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, I think uh, one thing I've noticed, the, the way media talks about suicide now, um, Logic, for example, he had that song 
where uh, the lifeline phone number was the, the title of the song and our lines blew up, right? And there was a lot of people reaching out just to see what it was like. What, what is it you guys do, you know? And they wanted to know if they ever did need us, could they really call this number? Um, so in a lot of ways, I think that really helped some of the stigma to see someone, you know, doing a music video saying, hey, if you need help, here's this number, right? That lets people know that it's okay to, to reach out. And we're starting to see a lot more of that. I think uh, TV shows now that may have an episode, uh, you know, dealing with suicide, they'll post the, the lifeline number at the end of it. And we always see calls increase uh, when something like that happens. So um, I think just, you know, the, the way we talk about it, we have to be okay with talking about suicide um, to really be able to address it. And I think uh, in a lot of ways, the things the media are doing are really helping us. Excellent, thank you for that. Um, Becky, can you walk us through a little bit about what Centerstone is doing to connect people to care, to break down the stigma and to help prevent suicide? Yeah, I'll be glad to. And I think now more than ever, the landscape is really ripe for, uh, you know, a real shift in um, kind of exactly what Lauren and Greg were talking about. You know, Lauren's been so integral in some of the 988 work. Um, I sit on the steering committee for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. And if you ask me right now the number, I would, it'll take me a second because it's a 1-800, it's long. Like when Logic's song was out, it was a little bit, you know, I didn't even know who Logic was. Um, but I found out who he was and, you know, but it's long. So to have this kind of 988 and it'd be really quick, that sets up the rightness. And Greg's absolutely right. There's more attention in media. There's a lot more celebrities. We've seen celebrity deaths. Um, and then you wrap COVID in, and I think it's really teed up the opportunity for us to see some shifts. There was a Harris poll that came out just today um, that talked about kind of this readiness for um, really good suicide prevention. 81% of the people in that Harris poll said, yes, we think national policy should be a priority around suicide prevention. That's huge. I don't think we would have seen that even a year ago. So there's lots of things individuals can do, communities can do. And then at Centerstone, because we're a, a behavioral health and healthcare system, um, what, what bigger priority should we have than keeping people alive, A, um, which used to kind of be where we stopped, but B, really being cognizant that not only do we need to keep people alive, but we need to make sure they feel like they have a life worth living and help them find a life that they feel like is worth living. So we've tried to really um, marinate, bake in, weave, whatever you know words you wanna use into our system of care, suicide um, prevention efforts so, um, from our culture, um, being one that places this at the highest priority to having a competent, confident, and skilled workforce, which even, you know, a few years ago, systems of care didn't really take on that it's our responsibility to make sure that we have the highest level of competent staff. Um, and then we have to make sure we're screening and assessing for suicide risk at all of the touch points that we have with individuals and in all of the programming that we have. And that we do that so that, you know, the identification can occur for people like Greg has described who are having a hard time um, and that we make sure that they get treatment from people that know how to provide that treatment to them. So there's a lot that gets, you know, woven into the system, but I think the biggest um, in, in behavioral health and really even healthcare physical health care is taking on this responsibility that we as systems of care have to leverage everything we have against this, or we're not really going to be able to move the needle. So you have kind of individuals and communities, and there's definitely stuff that can go on there, but that systems of care, health, physical health, and behavioral health really have to step up and see this as a core responsibility of what we do. Absolutely. Thank you. 
So we've had a few questions come in from people that are watching. So I wanna go ahead and pose this first question. Um, someone has asked about tips for self-care and feeling alone during the quarantine. Um, so do any of you have some tips on, on how someone can feel less alone, especially now that we're all you know, stuck at home? I mean, I'll take, I'll take the first stab and then pass it to Greg and Lauren. You know, we, we did a lot of interviews at the height of, of the shutdown and things like that. Um, and really, I think connectivity to others is relying on technology. You know, sometimes we kind of poo-poo technology and, you know, that's, it's too much is a bad thing. And I think it's allowed us, whether you're texting or calling or Zooming or having having a virtual um, happy hour with your girlfriends, or um, I know somebody in the height of it that went to a virtual costume party. Um, you know, little things like that. And even at the real height of it, I, um, you know, was overwhelmed like everybody else. And I remember um, at the real peak in March, I decided I was gonna put a letter of an alpha of the alphabet a day. I started at A and I went through the whole alphabet and I did it twice. But I just looked in my contacts on my phone and said, okay, who is in the A's that I kind of want to reach out to and see how they're doing. And I talked to people I have not talked to in years because I was just way too busy. Um, but I cycled through the alphabet twice during the height of it. And it really did make me feel a little bit more connected. I could commiserate a little bit and talk to some people. Um, but I think it takes being purposeful. Uh, and sometimes, you know, when it's all weighing down on you, that's a little bit tough. Yeah, and I'll, I'll jump in. I think that was great perspective, Becky. Um, I think something else just to keep in mind is that, you know, we've been in this for five or six months and there's an increasing look at a phenomenon known as crisis fatigue. And so I think first and foremost, um, starting to have a little bit of compassion with yourself, knowing that, People are feeling burnt out, tired, worried, um, and and that that it's okay to feel that way. Um, in terms of some solutions that can help manage that and help you feel a little bit better, um, you know, if you're really busy, figuring out when you can schedule self care anchors in the week. And so, if you look at your week and you can schedule maybe a couple days a week to sleep in a little bit or make a healthy breakfast or make a healthy dinner, just kind of things that you schedule, you say, these things are for me and I'm going to make them my anchor in the week. They can be small, but something throughout the week that is kind of, this is how you're taking care of yourself. Um, another thing that, um, that you can do is, is also um, in addition to the self-care pieces, um, practicing gratefulness, so our um, gratitude. And so thinking about what are the things that are going well? And I think it's so easy to be inundated with social media and we've not only got the coronavirus going on, we've got um, racial tensions throughout the US. We've got these really in powerful, intense conversations happening right now and they're hitting people at all different levels. And so, um, you know, taking a step back from social media, taking a step back from all the stuff that's out there to take care of yourself and look at your own life and thinking, what are three things I am grateful for for today? And so just having, you know, these softer moments of silence where you step back from all the noise and just kind of take care of yourself. And um, sometimes it, the easiest way to do that is to schedule those times in your week. Yeah, um, to jump back on the um, uh, kind of the isolation part of it, um, I think like Becky said, uh, it's so important that we utilize the technology that we have now. Um, it's easier than ever for us to, to reach out and get a, a hold of people. And a lot of us will talk ourselves out of it and convince ourselves that people are busy. You know, I don't want to bother them and, and things like that. Um, even uh, the 12 step meetings have went virtual now. You know, you can even do them over the phone. Um, you know, so there there are a lot of uh, places and things that are utilizing that technology, but um, we also have people that don't have access to that. And for them, you know, we have things like warm lines. Um, so if you're not in crisis, you just want someone to talk to, you can call a warm line and, and someone will listen and you will have someone to talk to for a while. Um, uh, Self-care, there's so many things. 
right? And, and I think about this a lot. A year ago, you know, this time a year ago, I was sitting around wishing I had time to do all these things I wanted to do. And now I have all this time and I'm, I haven't done them, you know? So I have to reflect back on all these goals and everything I've had in the past because now I have time to actually work on them. Um, you know, so things like that. Um, I love that I heard like kind of the gratitude thing. I think that's always really important. Um, Self-care looks a lot different for different people. You know, uh, I look, you know, kind of rough and scary and I totally put on a face mask and take a bubble bath, you know, because it, it makes me feel re-energized and happy afterwards. So um, just finding that one thing that works for you and, and sticking to it. Excellent. I think those are all really great tips. Um, we have one other question and it's uh, what someone said, you know, talking about suicide can, can potentially put that idea into somebody's head and they want to know if that's true. So does having conversations about suicide lead to more suicide or, or is that a, a, a myth? Yeah, I can see that question from Katie, and I am so happy that Katie asked that because a lot of other people are probably asking it too. Um, and, and the question is, is that true? And what we know is that's 100% not true. Um, that talking about it um, or asking or inquiring definitely does not um, plant a seed, so to speak. Uh, what we know is um, if you ask someone directly, and they're not, you know, in my experience, and Greg can chime in, um, they just acknowledge that they're not. And I haven't seen people be offended by that. It's more, you know, a caring. Um, if, if they are, and you're willing to, to do it, then I think what you're signaling and messaging to them is I'm a person that you can talk to about this. Because a lot of people in their lives probably aren't. And if they've even tried to tiptoe their toe in the water and ask someone to have a conversation with them and the person kind of says, I don't know how much longer I can do this. I don't know if I can hang on. And they're kind of smelling around a little bit or right? and the, and the person responds to them. How about those Titans? You think they're going to go to the AFC championship game again? I mean, really what you've messaged to them is you're not comfortable. And what we know is the um, people often might say that back to somebody because they don't know what to say. They're not knowledgeable. They're not comfortable, which is okay. We want to try to make sure people get more comfortable so that when somebody needs to A, be asked, or B, they kind of hint around at it, and you're that person that you don't have to know what Greg knows and Laura knows and I know and what Robert knows. You just have to show caring and get in the boat with them. We can take it from there. Um, Greg, you want to comment on that? Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know the the statistics on that. I thought uh, you might be able to best handle that, but I do know that we take a very uh, forward approach when asking people about thoughts of suicide. And something that uh, I keep in mind, you know, the people that are calling us. Um, they, they might not have always been so open about these thoughts, right? Kind of beat around the bush as I could, or you could say, um, or they make very vague suicidal statements that could go kind of one way or another, right? I don't want to be here anymore. Okay, you don't want to be at your home, you don't want to be in your state, or you don't want to be alive, you know? So it's important to just be as clear and blunt as possible so we know for sure what's going on with them. Um, and I, I think it is hard for some people to actually come out and say it. I think that's why they make the very vague statements. So when we just come out and say, are you having thoughts of suicide today? I think it lets them know it's okay to talk about it. You know, you, you've called the right people, you're at the right place. This is, this is what we want to help you with. So let's talk about it. That's actually a great uh, segue into our next question is someone wants to know what they should do if they have a loved one who won't call a crisis line or they're too embarrassed to call. So do you have any advice on that? I think Greg and I both can comment on that. Um, if a loved one won't call, um, feel free to call. 
um, we can surely, I mean, we, we YouTube and call other folks for help for all kinds of different things. Um, so we have to, the more I think we can normalize that lots of people, millions of people feel this way. Um, and it's really not any different um, because it's uh, an emotional issue and not a physical issue. So if a loved one wants to call in lieu of and let us kind of help them navigate that, um, or if they're too embarrassed to call, um, I would just encourage you to give it a try. I mean, look at Greg, you won't see him if you call, but let me tell you what, you will be dang lucky if you get Greg, if you call, because he's got a skill set that's going to help you. I mean, it would be this, you know, if I'm saying to my family member, my chest feels tight and my arm is numb, you know, they might say, are you having a heart attack? You know, like, do you think you might be having a heart? Let's get that checked out. Um, so we'll do everything within our power to help um, make sure that we see what's going on, see if there's any, you know, risk uh, of the person, and then really put a plan together with the person. And Greg can talk about this, about how to try to um, get this person what they need, whether it's situational, um, that they're having issues, or if it's a, a longer term diagnosis that they're dealing with, or if it's a substance abuse issue. Um, I think the more we can start viewing this through the lens of the same way we do physical health, uh, it's going to make people less embarrassed and less scary to call. Greg, I'll let you chime in on that one. Yeah, this, this could always be a challenge when someone is uh, hesitant to call in or, or feels embarrassed. Um, one thing I try to emphasize um, is that there, there is a solution, right? We're not just doing this and hoping that people get better. We, we know for a fact that people get better. You know, there's a lot of people out there that are, are walking proof that, you know, have survived a suicide attempt or multiple. And today they no longer have those thoughts and they, they have a very happy, meaningful life, you know? So I really try to um, get that across to people, you know? And I think if you have a family member who's calling us and saying someone won't call in, that's obviously a very supportive family member, you know? So I talk to them and try to get them to, to encourage that person right? Let that person know that you, you care about them and, and you'll be there with them while they call. You know, the, we can all get through this together. That's, that's one of the big things, I think, with uh, suicide. You know, people don't have to be alone in these thoughts, right? There's people out there that care and want to help them. Um, so, yeah, you know, it, it, and of course, just making that first call, right? Once you make that first call, all the other calls are going to be easier. You know, I know the first one is always the hardest, but I, I can pretty much guarantee you, if you call our crisis line, you are, you're not going to be intimidated, right? You're going to talk to someone that you can hear in their voice, genuinely cares, is, is there because they want to be there and there because they want to help you. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, we have one last question. Um, someone um, watching had a loved one in her inpatient care uh, this past summer, and they're doing better now, but they want to know how uh, they can support their loved one who, who um, is receiving treatment. This is one, I'm, I was really glad to, to see this question because this is a stat that, that those of us on the provider side are like, Ugh! because here's what happens. People go into inpatient care. Now this was, um, well, this summer, I mean, this summer hadn't been that long. There, there used to be this kind of sense that someone would go inpatient, they would get fixed and they would come out and it was all great and wonderful and fine. What we know from the research is the week, the week after discharge from an inpatient facility um, is the highest risk of suicide death of any other time. I mean, it goes up exponentially. I mean, it's, the number is outrageous in that week prior so what I would encourage this, you know, if you've had somebody, how can you continue to support them is a lot of what Greg said, verbally staying in touch with them. I know you were inpatient. I understand inpatient did not 
quote, fix all of the issues that were going on with you um, to, that got you to that place. And I'm here to be supportive in whatever way you need me to be. Um, but we have to, as a nation, get much more cognizant of this really tight time period post-discharge that we worry, uh, seriously worry about people dying from suicide. Um, so I think you, you definitely reach out to them uh, and let them know that, that you're there to be supportive and that you, you know, and an acknowledgement that you understand um, that simply going in the hospital, it, it's not like knee surgery. You go in, they fix your knee up, you have some PT, you know, there are risks just like with everything else of complications and on the mental health side, this is definitely a, a complication that's, that's dangerous. Absolutely, thank you. Um, one other question is, oh, go ahead, Greg. I was just gonna add something to that real quick. Um, sure. You know, if you're familiar with like drug and alcohol recovery, you know that the key to happiness and success is all about maintenance. Right, so you're not you're not cured if you go to rehab, but you got to do the maintenance to stay you know well and happy. And I think it's the same thing with inpatient. Yeah. You know, once you get out, there, it's all about the maintenance. Let's find what what works, right? So, is it seeing a therapist? Is it medication? Is it a you know a new social circle or whatever it may be? And encouraging them to continue to do those things. Mm -hmm. One of the calls we get most frequently is someone that thought they felt great and stopped taking their meds or decided they didn't want to see a therapist anymore. And then, you know, a week or so later, we're, we're getting the call. Um, so if you have a loved one that you know is, you know, new to services, um, maybe they're trying a new medication and they don't feel great about it, encourage them to keep trying, keep doing it and to talk to their doctors, right? Because their doctors are there to, to help them. They can only help with what they know about. So it's just maintaining those wellness tools, um, I think is really the key to success. And Robert, just to add one more thing, um, you know, if we think about Suicide Prevention Month, one of the goals of this month is to break down the stigma of access to mental health care. And Becky mentioned earlier in the conversation kind of compared, you know, something to having a heart attack. If we think about um, somebody that has a, a heart attack or an emergency episode around diabetes, they might go into the hospital, but they might have a follow-up plan and additional providers that kind of wrap around them, provide additional supports and services for months after they get out. And what we would hope to see as providers and caretakers and, you know, people in, the, in our various communities is that the stigma of mental health is broken down so that we, we view it similar to me other medical conditions, that when somebody has um, a more severe episode that requires hospitalization, that's perfectly okay. That's part of the healing process. And then that will likely require ongoing supports once they get out and that's also okay. So. Thank you so much. That was, that was great information. Uh, we have one last question and that is coming from Michael and he wants to know how he can um, initiate reaching out to a loved one who may have withdrawn from others um, especially once, once, you know, he's realized that this person has withdrawn. So any advice on, on reaching out to, to those individuals? I'll, I'll give a, a quick one and let Greg chime in. I mean, I think you don't want to be up in this person's grill, you know, going, Hey, 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 but can you be persistent in offering that you care about them and that you're here if they need something? Absolutely. So whether that's verbally, voicemail, text message, snail mail, you know, just to say, hey, I've noticed I hadn't heard from you in a while and I just want you to know I'm here. We call that non-demand, non-demand caring contacts. So you're not demanding or asking anything of your um, loved one. You're just simply saying, I'm here for you. And if you ever need help, I got you. Uh, and we do that, you know, out of Greg's shop at the call center, you know, we're doing that right now. We'll do it tonight. We'll do it tomorrow. That kind of non-demanding, caring touch point where it's, I'm not asking you to do anything, but I want you to know that I care about you. Uh, those, those can be incredibly impactful. Um, 
and that kind of can reach out, um, the research tells us is incredibly, incredibly effective. Yeah, I think uh, Becky nailed it there. Um, there's lots of ways to reach out and show someone that you care. Um, you know, especially without seeming pushy or that you're trying to, you know, push them into services or, or something like that. Um, you know, if it's a friend or a relative, just just be a, a friend, you know, be a relative, just call, say, what's going on? How are you doing today? I was thinking about you. Um, you know, in those little contact points, like she said, um, you know, you become that person that they're going to think of when they're ready to reach out for help. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate everyone tuning in today. Um, I just want to do a little plug. We're going to be doing these uh, discussion videos every Tuesday during the month of September. Each Tuesday at 2 p.m. Central, we'll have a different topic all around suicide prevention. So I really encourage everyone to, to tune in and you'll get to hear from a variety of our uh, center student speakers. Um, this video and all of those other videos will be available on centerstone.org backslash suicide, where you can also find um, statistics, uh, fact sheets, articles, and other information that we've talked about today and that we'll continue to talk about um, all month long. So with that, I just want to thank you all for, for participating, and um, I hope you have a good rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.